So today, um, I'm Marvin Malik. Today, we're going to talk about uh, a brief introduction to the strategy used within the current Medicare program for uh, to primarily to achieve cost control. They're supposed to also try to improve quality at the same time as they can. So yesterday, we talked about uh, that when you're going to control costs, uh, there's sort of two choices in the big picture. You could try to cut down on the total on all the procedures that doctors do uh, to patients, figuring some of them probably are not really necessary. And you could try to pick out the ones that aren't necessary and uh, somehow keep those from being done. In the sense that's going after volume, the number of procedures that are done. Alternatively, uh, you could go after uh, the price per procedure. So make no change at all in the number of procedures done, but instead uh, cut down on the number of procedures. Or yesterday we talked about you you guys came up with the idea of quality. Um, you could reduce quality, not get the very best machinery, not get the robot to do surgery, but instead have your surgeon do the surgery, whatever. So there's um, you could somehow make each intervention cost less, or you could try to cut down on the number of interventions. And as I said, you Reinhardt uh, came out with a study in 2003, which was confirmed in 2019, uh, indicating that 90% of the excessive costs in the US are due to higher prices rather than higher volume. And the title of the study was, It's the Prices Stupid. The reason he wrote stupid and phrased it that way, it's obviously a catchy title for a medical, was, that title was put in a regular medical journal if you look it up. And the reason he did that was because all the mainstream people, both public and private sector, all they could talk about were strategies to reduce the number of procedures. Nobody was going after the fact that to get a, to get a coronary bypass operation in Germany costs a fraction of what it does in the United States. And the same for almost every single procedure or even item, like how much does a hip prosthesis cost if you buy it? If you're in the United States, it costs you know a lot more. We, recently, I found out um, the chief, uh, the CEO at our, our tertiary care center in Vermont, said that he was taking some journalists on a tour. He said, "Yeah, this is a coronary stent, and he's tiny. He had it in his hand, and he, and he found out that it was thirteen hundred dollars. So it turns out in Germany, it's three three hundred fifty. So like a fraction of the price and, you know, no reason. It's just the way things we do things, the way we do things. So, um, you know, it seems more reasonable to go after uh, prices. Um, but here's the, rash, the ideological rationale for going after volume was based on the variations in different counties that we saw. Uh, we talked about yesterday that some counties, these elective procedures, DNC being a good example, varicose veins another good example. It, it varies by county. Uh, the variation could be due to any number of things. Uh, could be due to fraud, somebody bilking Medicare or bilking the private insurer, whoever's paying. Could be that doctors train differently. And you know, and this has actually been studied. They so this is interesting when it was first published. First published nineteen seventy three. Uh, it was very interesting and there's been a lot of study and there's still no one answer as to what what leads to this it's not all greed it's maybe not even entirely it entirely or even at all greed it's there's different medical traditions in different communities people are just trained differently so um anyway so this led to the assumption that the higher value care is the ones with fewer procedures the, here's the uh, value equation. Um, cost is easy to measure, quality much more differently, difficult. And uh, we talked about this. So the woman coming today is the she was she's really the chief quality officer, and she she basically create I think creates the measurements that Medicare is going to use to judge probably both the Medicare Advantage entities, as well as the other stuff they're working on. 
So I'm going to talk about the other stuff they're working on. So uh, here, so originally there was there were HMOs, and Dr. Dolcart talked to you about that. They were going to be teams of physicians, all employed by a single entity, working together, and they would provide better care, given a flat amount of money um, from premiums, and then you know they'd all work together. You get better care, and it would be more efficient. And in a way, the VA is kind of like that. This is called a staff model HMO when the employees are paid. Everybody who works on you, every doctor is paid by the company. They even own the hospitals. So it's a tightly integrated network. And that was uh, to be more efficient. And it, it is. The VA is more efficient. And Kaiser at staff model was, was more efficient as well. So it could provide the same care with reasonable quality at a lower cost. But it evolved into uh, what's called a group group model, just other models of managed care that was uh, where the money was controlled by private entities, but they didn't hire the doctors or own the hospitals. They just did the paying. So they're an insurance company, a health insurance company. But what, what got it to be called managed care was intrusion, the degree of intrusion into care. And so intrusive insurance companies were using guidelines. They were saying things, they were denying payment, they're requiring prior authorization. They also tried to get rid of some care through narrow networks that patients would have trouble negotiating. So um, delaying, denying care. So that was, so here's an, here's an article that just came out this week. My health insurance company is trying to kill me. I love this title. Anyway, so some woman was saying that there, she was getting so many letters, so many care denials when she was contending with a serious illness that she, this is the conclusion she arrived at. Anyway, so, um, so managed care became very unpopular. A movie came out called John Q, I think in 2002 or something. That was the era when managed care got a really bad name. So, uh, and, and in that movie, it's somebody gets to care denied and it's a, their child and so there's Denzel Washington was the protagonist and he was fighting for his kid to get some care that he needed and you know and so the managed care company was fighting him and by the end of the movie people were like cheering when something you know like really angry at all what was going on and cheering Denzel Washington up anywhere anyway so so it became managed care. That was what managed care was, just basically an insur intrusive insurance company, which we've already been talking about. So they stopped using the term. So let me just, I thought I had more of this. Anyway, so they stopped using the term, but really the concept of going after volume never really went away. And um, so, they re basically they rebranded and now something called value-based care is all the rage and uh some of the some of these uh soon to fail cost control procedures or cost control strategies used in the united states uh there's not that many but most of them last about 10 years before everybody declares it a failure value-based care has been going on for 12 or 15 years, you already saw the graphs on health costs in the United States. You know, it's not effective, but um, we still add it. And this one's still all the rage. And uh, if you looked at some of the readings on your reading list, you saw one art, uh, a number of articles where people are advocating for it and saying, we have to go faster. We have to stop paying for low quality. And so here's the definition. It's a framework for restructuring healthcare systems with the overarching goal of value for patients, value defined as health outcomes per unit of cost. So that's the value equation we just talked about. Concept was introduced 2006 by a couple of people through implementation, though implementation on aspects of value-based care had begun much earlier with patient value as the overarching goal, value-based healthcare uh, emphasis on systematic measurements of outcomes and costs, restructuring provider organization. 
that's fiction. Anyway, transitioning toward bundled payments and within this framework, cost reduction alone is not seen as enough. You also have to improve quality. Health outcomes have to improve to enhance value. So that's a whole bunch of words. Uh, typically, and what there's a word that it usually is in the value-based care definition, which is coordination. They all say that we're working on coordination of care, but in reality, they do nothing. 